was uh, a great love of mine. Now, I would love to tell you I took this picture, but that would be an absolute lie. On my first trip to Africa, we spent hours in Nairobi National Game Park, and uh, we, we looked at animals, but we kept looking for lions. And I, was, I literally was praying, Lord, you know I want to see a lion. I've wanted a pet lion since I saw Born Free in the 60s, okay? Amen. You can have your little dogs. I want something that can eat the neighbors. But anyway, so uh, I've always wanted one. I just thought it'd be cool. And so I prayed. We looked. And we finally found two mother lions and about five cubs. But I couldn't get a good picture. So I asked my safari guide if I could just step out of the car and take a picture. He said, absolutely not. I was like, they're they're 15 feet away to be okay. He's like, no, you can't get out of this vehicle. So I said, can I at least roll down the window and take a picture? He said, no, that thing can get to this window before you can think to put it up. This is the most dangerous thing out here. You cannot roll down the window. So I never got a good picture. This is from Google Images. But I say that to remind you, even though they look cute in the picture, how dangerous this animal is how ferocious this animal is. I say that because we're in a sermon series called I Didn't Sign Up For This. And in this series, we are addressing that many of us find ourselves in times where we go, hang on, I I didn't sign up for this. Last week, we covered Job, who could have easily said, I didn't sign up for this. As a matter of fact, that's kind of what he did say, right? Lord, if you come here and talk to me, I could, you know, make my case, convince you you made a mistake. That didn't go so well for Job, by the way. So this week, we're looking at Daniel. Now, there's a lot in the book of Daniel, tons of great stuff. But today we're looking at it in the context of I didn't sign up for this, which means the lion's den. And so I put the picture of the lines up to remind you the application of 1 Peter 5.8. Because we look at Daniel in the lion's den as a past distant story, and we forget what Peter reminds us. Peter says, stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. You see, the reality is you're in the lion's den too. Just sometimes you forget. And so I want us to let Daniel's story give us some insights into this concept. I didn't sign up for this. Now, when Craig and I came up with this uh, series, one of the things we were thinking is these three questions that many people wonder. Does God see me? Is he looking at me? Does he see me? Secondly, does God care about me? Does he care? And third, can I trust him? Can I trust him? Now, uh, on a separate note, by the way, I think Case for Faith is one of the best books you can read on that answer. But uh, just in case you're watching, in case you're in here, just make note of that. Now, let's go back to Daniel and let's see how we address these three questions from the story of Daniel. You see, in Daniel's day, he is a captive, first in the kingdom of uh, Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, and then in eventually the kingdom of the Medo-Persians under Darius the Mede. And so what happened is he's one of these uh, bright, young uh, Israeli men who uh, is taken captive. And at the time of the captivity, they cannot believe this would ever happen to them. Israel's position is the temple, the temple, the temple. We have the temple, so it can't happen to us. It's kind of like many points in our history, what have we said? It couldn't happen here. All those things that happened all over the world couldn't happen here. We're the we're the powerful nation, and I'm not trying to mess with your politics. I'm just saying there is some similarity in that, right? That, you know, we're going to be protected because of who we are. That's how the Israelites felt. But eventually, because of uh, the way they had lived, because of God's plan and his working, the Israelites are taken into captivity. So Daniel proves himself as an outstanding young man, even in the midst of his environment. And his environment is not what he signed up for. Now, right now, if you're in this room and you haven't experienced some kind of disruption, you are an exceptional human being. Because in 2020, we have gone through uh, exposing some racial injustice in America. We've gone through uh, racial, uh, uh, I mean, riots and protests as a result of that. 
We have gone through a pandemic and are still going through a pandemic, and it's always evolving. One, one moment we don't have to wear masks, and the next minute we do have to wear masks, and now there's talk about maybe wearing goggles. I mean, it's always evolving. How will it affect us? How will it get us? How will we be tested? And, and, and we never really get to rest on this issue, do we? And then in the midst of all of this, guess what we have? An election year. Yes, stick a fork in my eyes, please. Fortunately, I don't have cable, so I don't see as much as those who do have cable. And, uh, and I'm not on too many email lists, and I don't answer numbers that I don't recognize. So if you call me and I don't have you in my contacts, leave a message, because I'm, I'm convinced right now every call is a political fundraiser. But we have politics, pandemic, and social issues. We are in a disrupted society. We may not be taken captive into another nation like Daniel, but we have our own set of disruptions. And so in the midst of this, we could all say, just like Daniel, I didn't sign up for this. I didn't sign up for this. And so we're going to look and and explore the ideas from a man who went in the lion's den. First, though, I want you to remember this scripture in Matthew chapter 5, verse 45. And I want you to remember this also because uh, many of us have, um, many of us have probably had somebody share a political post or email or opinion with us. Regardless of which side of the aisle you're on, the people on the opposite side have a, a very bleak opinion if their person doesn't win, okay? So, the people on the, uh, I'm not even fond of this, but the people on the left say we're in bad trouble if the right wins, and the people on the right say we're in bad trouble if the left wins. And I want to remind you, we're in the end all in the same place. And so in Daniel's point, it was true also. Daniel was a righteous guy living in Israel. He wasn't one of the people who caused Israel's sin that led them to captivity. But look at what Matthew says in chapter 5, verse 45. For he, God, gives sunlight to both the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the just and the unjust alike. So Daniel lives in Israel. He is doing all the right things, but he is experiencing the overall results of Israel's life. So I say that because regardless of you as an individual, you are still living in this overall experience. Now, Let's jump into Daniel. Let's see if this story makes sense for our common day. In Daniel chapter 6, verse 1 through 3, the story begins. Darius the Mede decided to divide the kingdom into 120 provinces, and he appointed a high officer to rule over each of the provinces. The king also chose Daniel and two others as administrators to supervise the high uh, high officers and to protect the king's interest. Daniel soon proved himself more capable than all the other administrators of the high offices. Because of Daniel's great ability, the king made plans to place Daniel over his entire empire. Now, if you know anything, the higher you get up on the rank, the more there are people that aren't thrilled that you're there. Some people are, but there are going to be people that are jealous and envious. I've seen this in almost every secular work environment I've been in. Somebody in the office gets a promotion. Somebody else is upset that that person got promoted. And thus, this little drama ensues. So the drama is ensuing for Daniel and all these other people, all these other administrators and high officers are jealous. And so they come up with a plot. How can, we, how can we catch Daniel? And the Bible tells us they examine Daniel's life and they can't find anything to turn him in for. Nothing. And can you imagine that? This is the, the Bible's glimpse to us to show us what kind of life Daniel is living. Daniel is a righteous guy. They are digging Now think about this. We're used to this in our lifetime. There was a time when a politician ran and and they didn't look at every single thing that happened in his life. But now in the digital age, if you run for an office, we're going to go back and look at pictures from your kindergarten, right? We're going to look in every closet. We're going to look for everything. They do this to Daniel and they find nothing. And the Bible tells us that in verse 5, they say to themselves, the only way we're going to be able to trap this guy is by using his religion by using his beliefs 
That's the only way we're going to be able to trap this guy. And so they go to the king, and this is our next verse, verse 6 and 7. They go to the king with this plan. So the administrators and the high officers went to king, the king and said, Long live King Darius. We are all in agreement, we administrators, officials, high officers, advisors, and governors, that the king should make a law that he will strictly enforce. Give orders that for the next 30 days, any person who prays to anyone, divine or human, except to you, your majesty, will be thrown into the lion's den. Now, according to the way the, the laws of the Medo-Persians work, when the king enacts a law, it is concrete. It is un unbendable. They obviously didn't have lawyers then. It's unbendable. And so, once it's stated, it will remain. Even the king will not be able to break it. Now, they know why they're making this law, because as they have examined Daniel, they know Daniel prays daily, and he is not going to back down from it. They realize that. That's why they have made this law. Now, the king has no idea why they've really made this law. They're just playing on his, his ego, and it works. And so, uh, you know, this is the typical thing, again, in that drama, when one person is being elevated and others are jealous, they'll start scheming. And we've seen this. We've seen this to the point that almost every one of us now is jaded at some point in our news and our politics because we're wondering, is this real or is that the other guy? No matter who it is. So th this is what's happening here. Now, I've got a little thing I want you to remember, a little, little thing I typed up here. It's not a Bible verse, but I want you to see this. I want you to maybe remember this because to me, this is a principle that stood out in this story. So one thing we see several times in the book of Daniel is when others are standing, the followers of God are kneeling. And when others are bowing down, the followers of God are standing. You see... These guys know what Daniel will do. And Daniel goes to his room with the window open and he prays facing Jerusalem daily. Multiple times a day, he's got his face towards Jerusalem praying to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the great creator, the I am. And he is praying and they know that will happen. And so they've set their trap. And here's what it tells us in Daniel chapter 6, verse 16. So, the, the, so at last, the king gave orders for Daniel to be arrested. They come and tell the king and thrown into the den of the lions. Now the king is heartbroken over this. It, the Bible tells us he lost sleep because he knows he can't break his law, but he's trying to find a solution. And so it says, as the king is putting Daniel in the lions, then he says, may your God, whom you serve so faithfully, rescue you. The king goes to his palace that night and doesn't sleep, waiting to see what will happen. And uh, the Bible tells us in verse 19 that early the next day, the king gets up. He runs to the, to the pit where Daniel has been put in this pit with the lines and a rock, has, a stone has sealed it. And he's shouting before they can even remove the rock, Daniel, has your God who you serve saved you? And we get this response from Daniel in, uh, in verse 21, 22, Daniel says, long live the king. That's his first answer. He doesn't say, hey, you're a scumbag and God has validated me. You know why? Because Daniel's character is the same throughout. And so Daniel says, long live the king, but yes, God has protected me. I'm great. It doesn't say that. That's Mark's speech. But you, you get the point. I'm great. This all works. It's wonderful. So, of course, if you know the story, the king gets the stone rolled away, pulls Daniel out, throws all of the guys who trapped him in with their families. Not a good fate for them. And then in response to what happened to Daniel, here's what you need to see. Verse 25 through 27. Listen to what the king declares as a result of this story. Peace and prosperity to you. I declare that everyone throughout my kingdom should tremble with fear before the God of Daniel. He rescues, uh, for he is the living God, and he will endure forever. His kingdom, this is, this is Darius speaking, his kingdom will never be destroyed, and his rule will never end. He rescues and saves his people. He performs miraculous signs and wonders in the heavens and on the earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. You see, why did all this happen to Daniel? Who could easily say, I didn't sign up for this. Why am I in this environment? Why is this happening to me? Why am I in this pit? And it all happened for the greatness of God's plan and the glory of God. 
And sometimes we find ourselves saying, Lord, why is this happening to me? And really, the real answer is, it's not about you. You just happen to be the canvas. You know, Isaac could have said that. Hey, I got a dad who seems to want to shove a knife in my chest. What I ever do? And the Lord says, it's not about you. I'm making a beautiful illustration of the coming Messiah on the same mountain offered by a father with a miraculous son, a son from a miraculous birth. You're a canvas to me. Daniel's a canvas to the glory of God. Remember when the disciples say to Jesus, why was this man born blind? Was it his sin or his parents' sin? Jesus says, neither. It's that the power of God can be displayed. Which, by the way, healing a person born blind is one of the three miracles the Pharisees had said only the Messiah could do. There is an intentionality to that moment. You see, Daniel's event is to display God to a world that needs to know the true and living God. And notice that Darius says, God saves and rescues. Think about that. Even the man who doesn't know God and spouses that God saves and rescues. Now, I've told you many times before that the Old Testament stories give us a foreshadowing of Jesus. So even in this story, it's here. For example, Daniel was taken from his home, left his home. Jesus left his home, came here. Daniel has to live as a servant. Jesus came and lived among us as a servant. Uh, He is betrayed by the leaders of his day. Jesus was betrayed by the leaders of his day. He's thrown into a pit. Jesus was put into the grave. It's sealed with a, a rock. Jesus was sealed with a rock. Daniel comes out alive saved from the lions. The lions are kind of synonymous with death. Jesus comes out alive, resurrected, and so uh, there is some similarity in these passages. It reminds us of a God who not only sees us, not only cares about us, but we can trust. Can we trust him? See, first we ask, do you see me? Even Job last week asked that question in Job 34. It says, his eyes are always on mortals. He sees their every step. I think of when Jesus is at at Simeon's house and the woman is there of ill repute and she pours all of her perfume on Jesus to anoint him and the Pharisee is disgusted and all this and Jesus looks at him and says, look at her. What is he saying? I see her. You don't. You see an identity. You don't see her. This is a reminder. God always sees us. His eyes always upon us. And even in those moments where we wonder, do you see me right now? Do you see what I'm going through? Do you see what our family is suffering? Do you see what event we're in? The answer is he always sees. He always sees. And does he care? Does he care? Listen to Matthew chapter 6, verse 26. Look at the birds. Look at the birds. They don't plant, they don't harvest, or store food in barns, for your heavenly Father feeds them. And aren't you more valuable to him than they are? Now, maybe some of you are still struggling with that question, but you shouldn't be because your value is infinite. God created all that exists according to his story. God created everything that exists so there'd be a place for you to live so that you could choose to be in relationship with him because he loves you so much. He wants a bride to be with him for eternity. You matter to God. That should be concrete to you. And if it's not at the end of this service, we're going to put up my contact number. Please see me because we need to talk about that. You have got to get this down. God cares about you. You matter to God. If you're on digital, hit me up on Facebook, Instagram. We've got to have this conversation. You matter to God. Can you trust him? Absolutely. If the birds can, you can. We've got a Bible story full of people who trust him. Daniel goes in the lion's den without even fighting at old age. Confident in who God is. Job learned that he could trust God. We've got a Bible full of people who could say we learned to trust God. Martha and Mary had the same question. Hey, if you got here on time, our brother wouldn't be dead. And then he raised him from the dead. You know why he waits four days? Again, the Pharisees taught that the soul hovered over a man for three days, but on the fourth day, he's truly dead. The decay has begun to set in on the fourth day, it's over. So Jesus delays because they have always said only the Messiah could do this miracle. 
You see, Martha and Mary are thinking it's about them. Why haven't you done this? But God has a much greater purpose. And when he achieves his purpose, not only is his purpose met, but Martha and Mary's purpose is met. You see, the question is, can you trust him? The answer is absolutely. Does the enemy want you to think you can't? Sure. He puts that doubt in all of our minds. But it is resolved that you can trust him. He is the God of all creation. He is always in charge. There's no detail missing. He he knew before the world world was formed, what would be happening in 2020? He knew there's not one thing that's going to happen today that slips under the radar that God doesn't see, they doesn't know about. If a sparrow falls from the earth, from the sky to the earth, he knows it. He knows the details that most of us think are inconsequential. Can I trust him? Absolutely. Absolutely. Proverbs 3, 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on what? Your own understanding. Listen, if the question is between the heart, the spirit saying, trust God, and the mind saying, uh, we got some problem here, let me tell you which you choose. The heart, the mind can be deceived. Okay? Go with the heart. Trust in the Lord. Can you trust him? Absolutely. Absolutely. Listen, Jesus came from the glory of heaven, put on flesh, dwelt among us like a servant, just like Daniel, living in a distant land under a distant king. Jesus is here living in this, cor- this corrupted kingdom, which have, someday he will completely restore and destroy the enemy who is running rampage over us right now. He came and he died so that you could be forgiven and redeemed, cleansed forever, so that the Spirit of God could dwell within you and you could have eternity with God, which begins now, not at some distant point. He is in you. He is with you. You can trust him. As a matter of fact, you need to trust him. If you have not received Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, today's the day. There's no need to wait. I mean, are you, are you waiting to see what comes next in 2020? I mean, surely you all, like me, have gotten the memes, you know, what comes next in September. I mean, we had the, the pandemic, we had the, the disruptions, we had the politics, and we had the murder hornets, we had dust from the Sahara. Who knows what's next, right? I mean, I, I, I mean there's no telling. Why would I put off today the decision of eternity? Can you trust him? Yes. The Bible says if you receive Jesus Christ by faith as your Lord and Savior, that that, that he will cleanse your sins and redeem you. Yes, you can trust him. Now, listen, for the found people, for the people who have already made that decision, what do we do with this story? Well, first off, it's time for us to trust. It's time for us to trust regardless of where we're at, who wins the next election, regardless of of what the worst case scenario you've been sent online is. Perhaps you've been told like me that soon we will be an annexation of China. Well, guess what? God will still be in control. You can still trust him. You know how I know? I've been to China and I've met Christians who trust him. No matter what happens, you can trust him. No matter what happens, he is in control. No matter where this goes, church, you are good. You are good. He has got you. Does that mean that that I can promise you painless rose gardens, no troubles? No. But I can promise you the God of all creation will walk with you through whatever there is. That's what I can promise you. I can't promise you the removal of every pain and trouble and heartache. But I can promise you the God of creation to walk through it with you. Remember in Psalm what David wrote, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Church, this is one of our brightest moments to let the world see why we don't have fear. In a moment where the world is collapsing with fear. Every day I'm getting emails uh, trying to uh, elicit my vote. And they're very fear-based. The world is covered up with fear. Some people have not left their house since March. 
The world is struggling with fear. Church, this is our shining moment. For someone to say, hold it, why, why aren't you panicked? Why aren't you distraught? How are you so calm? Why do you smile? Where's your joy come from? Because the God of all creation is still in control. Because the God of all creation lives within me. Because the God of creation's got all this. And because the God of creation has a plan that far exceeds my understanding or my wisdom or my knowledge. His ways are beyond my ways. He's up to something and I don't know what it is. But if I'll just trust him, it's really a lot more cool just to see where he goes rather than to try to control. So church, let me close with this verse. Isaiah 35, 4. And I didn't even put it up because I just want you to listen. Tell everyone who is discouraged, be strong and don't be afraid. God is coming to your rescue, coming to punish your enemies. Now your enemies are not flesh and blood according to the scripture. Your enemy is the rulers of high places, the spiritual hosts of wickedness, the 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 darkness of the kingdom of darkness. He is coming to destroy that enemy and to rescue you. It started on a cross and it has an incredible completion. How can you trust him? How can you walk without fear? Because that plan has never been changed. He is coming. When is not mine to know, but I know he is in control. Church, I don't chastise you, I don't judge you, but I encourage you. I try to remind you, this is our time to not have fear. This, this, there, there are Christians to this day that are meeting in persecuted nations. We're here in a building. Our biggest headache is a mask. There's no guards outside. You all, we can have joy. We can have strength. We can have trust.